I'm very happy to welcome everybody to um, one of many great um, RS Days of Learning events. This is Artists Among Us. Um, looks like we have a really good group. I think that I heard that there are about 30 people um, registered, which I think is one of the high counts for um, the week. So that's great. Um, thank you, everyone. Just by a quick show of hands, um, who during pandemic has missed going to museums and galleries? <laughs> I have two. And who misses seeing the architecture and art at Road of Shalom? I do. <laughs> so anyway, one of, the, one of the silver linings of this time is while we often can't see uh, art um, live in museums and galleries, there has been a great increase in online programming for art. And um, Artists Among Us is actually not a new program, um, but this is the first time that this would be on, online in this form, of course. So I think that you'll really enjoy today's program. Um, what we're going to be doing today is you um, will meet three uh, Road of Shalom members who also happen to be um, really wonderfully um, accomplished and inventive um, artists. And we'll be learning about their work, about their creative processes, and also how their experiences and or identities and or interests and or insights and or values <laughs> as to somehow um, inform and shape um, their work. So uh, this program should have started at one. We're just a few minutes late. Um, we'll be wrapping up at about at 2.15, um, although there will, there will be a 15 minute additional time that will be unmoderated, um, just open, dis open discussion following. Um, so my name is Matt Singer. I've been an RS member since 1997. Um, and have been involved in arts programming over the years. And um, today's wonderful panelists are Bettina Escoriza, uh, Linda Carp Rudo, and Joe Brin. Um, again, all are RS members. And um, many, many, many thanks to our tech angel, Mark Lowenstein, for his patience and help with us in preparing this program, which has been, I think it might be a little bit more complicated because it's a bit more multimedia than um, perhaps other events. And um, I should note before we get started that the event is being recorded. So um, if you um, are not interested in being recorded yourself, um, just turn, turn off your own video um, and, um, and uh, mute yourself. Um, otherwise, you'll be recorded. Um, but I, it doesn't seem like that's been a problem with other classes. But again, if you don't want to be recorded, just turn off your video. Um, so we'll begin um, this program uh, with the prayer um, for learning, um, which Mark will put on screen. And I will, um, oh, uh, if, if you're not um, on the panel, if you could um, mute yourself, that would be great. So I will be leading the prayer. And if anybody you know, wants to read along, that's wonderful, of course. Um, and, uh, after we say the prayer, we'll go um, right into uh, the, um, the program, beginning with the artist presentations. Um, if you have any technical questions, please add them to the chat. And I might as well say now, um, while we're waiting for the prayer, um, we're gonna have a Q&A session, um, one single Q&A session after the three artist presentations. So um, during the presentations, if you have questions that arise that you'd like to ask, just put them in the chat as well. Can you see the prayer? Um, actually, no, I only, I see your phone. Oh, okay. I think Same thing that close. happened yesterday. Yeah. I forget what I had to do. Do you want me to share it? Sorry. Screen and then, and then reopen with the prayer. I don't understand. You, you may need to stop sharing and then yeah. share the prayer. Susan, why don't you just go ahead and share it, please? Okay. 
Okay, so um, Baroka Tadanoi Elohinu Melakalam, Asher Kirishanu Bamitvota Vitivanu, La Asof Bidivre Torah, Blessed are you, Adonoi our God, sovereign of all, who hallows us with mitzvot, commanding us to engage with words of Torah. So thank you very much for that. Um, so the structure of today's class will be that, again, we have three artists. So each of the artists will have a 15 minute presentation, um, which will be a, a, you know, a nice, lovely blend of, of them discussing their work and then also showing their work. Um, in one case, it's sculpture and in two other cases, it's film. Um, so there'll be a lot of great visual delights coming your way. And then again, following that, we'll have 15 minutes of question and answer session. So again, um, since everybody's going to be on mute, and since this is a little bit of a complicated program to keep things rolling along nicely, as questions occur to you, please put them in the chat, and then we'll be getting to them during the Q&A session. Um, and I believe that we can move right into the um, artist presentations, which is the, the reason um, for this event. And we're going to begin with um, Bettina Esquariza. Um, Bettina was born in Asuncion, Paraguay, um, and is a filmmaker, writer, and artist living in Philadelphia. Um, she is a natural storyteller, and I love this description. Um, she is from a family of frustrated mystics, spectacular liars, and ill-fated thieves, and awful <laughs> politicians. So that begs enough questions for much more than even our 75 minutes. Um, her work deals with indigenous knowledge, um, specifically the thoughts and knowledge of uh, the Guarani people in Paraguay, um, of which uh, Bettina um, is a member, um, along with colonization, immigration, anarchism, and exile. So again, lots of content there. Um, Bettina also does inter international human rights work with the United Nations, which is pretty amazing focusing specifically, specifically on the role of indigenous peoples and indigenous knowledge in helping to address and correct the current climate crisis. And among um, other accomplishments and honors, Bettina is a Sundance Knight Fellow, and she is a research and curatorial fellow at the Slot uh, Foundation at the University of Pennsylvania. So, um, so much to get to know and get to see um, from Bettina, and I am going to turn things over to her. Hey, everybody. It's so great to be here. Um, thank you for having me. And I guess uh, I, I was asked to um, contextualize my work within the framework of um, Judaism as part of, you know, for this particular talk. And I guess, you know, like, like, Every, everybody has a different a different story um, and for me you know my family is um, you know supposedly we're like historically Sephardic I, I don't have any sort of paperwork to prove that other than a bunch of last names and some kind of bizarre stories that you know have moved around through time but um, my grandmother uh, married a Jewish man and when we migrated to the to the U.S. We lived in this um, Jewish neighborhood in this Jewish building in Miami Beach, and that was, you know, part of my migration story. Story is that I sort of landed in this community of retired Jews, and it was it was awesome. It was it was amazing, and um, it definitely shaped a lot of um, how I think about the world. And at this particular point in time, I'm in the process of going through a formal conversion with Rabbi Friedman, which is what brought me here to you all. Um, and yeah, but I mean, I'm a, I'm a mixed race person. My family is very mixed and we do have a connection to our indigenous ancestry and our indigenous language, um, Guarani. Uh, the language uh, is the official language of Paraguay of, alongside Spanish. Um, and, you know, people have different, because of institutional like racism, people have different relationships to their indigenous culture. But I was raised to be proud of it, which is awesome. Uh, but all that being said, I also, I mean, I wasn't raised in an Abrahamic faith. I was raised in the occult. My mother's an occultist. Um, so that was also really fun. And I'm an artist and I'm gonna show you some films. So I have 
two things I'm going to show you. One of them I'm not going to show you in completion because I, I don't have enough time, but um, it's part of uh, part of my Sundance Fellowship. I made this short film that's meant to serve as a proof of concept for a feature film that I'm working on now. So we're going to watch about four minutes of that, and then we're going to watch the first episode of an episodic series, um, and we'll watch that episode in full. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and you'll let me know if the sound is working. Once I start sharing my screen, it's gonna be a little bit tricky. What you wanna do is when you share, select that button on the left to share the sound. Yep, I got it. Okay, so let's see here. We can't go back there. No. It's the res. I need to go home. That's the first place I'm gonna look for us. We can hide there. We can't do that, Russ. Yes, we can. My grandma, she will help us. We need to cross the border right now. That's no. our only chance. I need to go home. It's not a good idea. My family, they'll take care of us. Is anyone else here? What do you mean? Grandma, I need to know if anyone's been looking for me. No, and what's going on? Susie, I know you're in trouble. Tell me what's happening. Why did I? Why? What's going on? What did he do? No, 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 he, he didn't do anything. It's, he's helping me. <sighs> Talk to me, my girl. talking about who is it my neighbor did he hurt you no why again grandma i'm afraid if i tell you it's just gonna make things worse rosie you need to tell me what's happening and you need to tell me now
not humans abusing kids. Okay, that's where we're stopping this one. <laughs> um, and let me see, I'm gonna go to the other one now. So like I said, that is, um, it's a proof of concept, concept short film for a feature that is currently in development and that process is extremely slow. Um, let's see, I think I'm in the right place, okay. All right, this one we'll watch in full. Do, do I need to mute myself or no? Um, everything's okay? All right, awesome. this is exactly. I think it's a space to discuss my process of learning the Guarani language and the philosophy that lives in the language, and possibly an excuse to hang out with friends from my childhood. I'm from Paraguay, but I've lived in the United States since I was eight years old. Paraguay is a mestiza nation, meaning most of the people are of mixed indigenous, black, and European descent. But the so-called post-colonial nation-building projects that led to territorial independence from Spain has created a kind of break with mestiza identity, which has been primarily replaced with a national identity. Meaning, if you ask most people what their identity is, they will most likely answer that they are Paraguayan, and that will be the end of the discussion. It also feels necessary to point out that the concept of mestiza as an identity comes from the Spanish-imposed racial caste system and is related to the invention of the concept of race and its implementation as a system of hierarchy. Back home in Paraguay, we have two official languages, Spanish, the colonial language, and Guarani, or Abanye, one of the indigenous languages of the territory that is encompassed by the nation-state of Paraguay. Despite the fact that both of them are fluent, my parents did not teach me or my brother how to speak Guarani. After our migration, my family had a lot going on, and it felt more important that my brother and I become fully acculturated to the U.S. way of life. Our experience is not unique. It is something that a lot of child immigrants go through. I'm on a group chat on WhatsApp with my mom and her side of the family, and they are always chatting in Guarani. I rarely understand what they are saying. And I always have to ask what everything means. And though I feel blessed to learn new bits of the language, I wish that I could be a part of the flow of conversation. One day, my mom sent me this sticker via text. Seeing this image sent me on a journey to an alternate dimension, where my childhood pal, an alien named Alf, was speaking my indigenous language. My Alf doll was my favorite doll when I was a kid. I wish I still had it. Hello. Hi. Um, why do I look like this? Because I don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> You're not kidding. Listen, I'm a filmmaker. I'm used to working with actors and crews on controlled sets. But the Rona has me stuck inside, so... Here we are. 
in outer space. Perhaps you should have written an essay instead. I fear the only way out is in at this point. Okay, well, I guess we're going to do this. So who was that pilot? My wife. You'll meet her once you learn how to animate her. That's fair. I'm not, I'm not very good at this, so just wait on that. Hey, uh, so, hey, um, question. Uh, would you help me learn what I mean? Please, I do. Oh yeah, my Guarani voice is different from my regular voice. Don't convince you about it, okay? Are you ready to learn something now? Sure. Okay, repeat after me. Pora winakihije. Pora winakihije. Who has summoned me to this strange corner of the universe? Get in, Fugus. We're gonna learn Guarani. Oh, Avanya, I guess of course. How positively delightful. <laughs> so those are the two pieces um, that I'm going to show. And um, just in case anybody has any questions for Alf, uh, my best friend Michael Candelore is here joining us, and he is the voice of both Alf and Slimer. Um, and yeah, so that's it. I don't know. I think we should probably move on to the next person. All right. Thank you, Bettina. So um, so yeah, a lot to. A lot to unpack there. <laughs> Two very different, um, you know, of presentations that you know you can see are addressing similar issues, but in completely different ways. And I love the the element of humor and surrealism in the one versus the high drama of the other. So, um, but we can get to that in the Q and A session. And again, please send in your questions. <laughs> um, so our next artist is Linda Carp um, Rudo. Um, who has been working in the arts for 35 years here in Philadelphia. Um, after completing her undergraduate degree at Moore College of Art and Design and a master's degree at University of the Arts, she began working as a professor in the Art Institute of Philadelphia's bachelor degree program. She also started her own business, Carp Marketing, after 15 years as an award-winning graphic designer. Um, Linda first explored and grew to love um, figural sculpture um, as a college freshman. And she um, continued that passion um, with, uh, I'm assuming, classes at Fleischer Art Memorial and um, has won awards from Fleischer um, for the work um, she's created in sculpture. So it is my pleasure to introduce Linda. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, so. I'm, my talk is fairly casual. Uh, it's based on the kinds of questions and comments that people have said when they've seen my work in person. So I'm just, uh, Matt gave you a little idea, a really brief story of how I got into this and um, where I went from there. And I'll tell you a little bit about the process of making and casting sculpture. And then I'll show you some of my pieces. Okay, so to start, um, when I was at Moore College of Art and Design as a freshman, um, I had one of the toughest teachers in the school and I earned an A in it. It was a class called three-dimensional drawing, which was actually figure sculpture. I really enjoyed it and I figured if he thought I could get an A, then maybe I was good at this um, and made a mental note to try to get back to it at some other time since I was really there for graphic design. Somewhere around 20 years later, my husband, can, my then boyfriend convinced me to take a class at PATHA with him, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, where we both agreed to take a figure sculpture class. And um, 
I started going to Fleischer Art Memorial about 12 or 13 years ago, and of course haven't gone since March. Uh, if you know anything about clay sculpture, it's very dirty and messy, not something you can really do in your house. Um, so I really miss that. But anyway, um, I have been entering work in the shows, the student shows, and I've won a bunch of awards, and that just makes it feel all that much better, but that's not really why I'm there. So now let me tell you a little bit about the process. I don't know how many of you know anything, but the first thing is you need an armature. This is a pretty well-used, ugly armature, but you put the arms and head and feet, whatever the motion of the figure is. The model is on a stand in the middle of the room and everybody else uses a kind of a stand where you place your armature and you it has wheels and you walk around the figure constantly because after all, a figure is 360 degrees, which is why I was hesitant to just show you images and not the actual pieces. So once you have the action, you start putting clay on, it's a water-based clay, although you can use something called plastiline, which is oil-based. It get, it's like very yucky in your fingers, but you can use that. Um, after you finish it and you like your piece and Mark, if you would show uh, one, I think it's one, two, and three. Um, these are some pieces that I really in, loved and we were not, they were not running any casting classes. So I couldn't cast them, so I had to tear them down. Are you able to open them, Mark? Um, hang on. <laughs> Sorry. So while he's trying to do that, what you're going to see is the uh, two pieces, three pictures in this water-based clay. And you can get a pretty good idea what it looks like. It's kind of a reddish color. Um, you cover it up in between weeks with plastic and wet cloths and then you come back and you open it up and you continue work. Um, these pieces were maybe three, about eight to 12 hours, depending. Sometimes we did three week studies, sometimes we did two week studies. Um, Mark, should I try to open it on my computer? Um. I thought I had it. You uh, did, you just showed us the files, but you didn't open them. You were showing us this picture uh -huh. and all of the files were on it. Yeah, I thought I had, so I'm sorry about this, Linda. <laughs> sorry, folks. Linda, can you share them um, from, your, from your computer? Um, I don't think I'm in screen share. There, there we go, there we go. Okay, so this was a piece that I really, not to, you know, it was just, I really liked it. It really looked like the woman. Um, I could not cast it, as I said. Keep going. And that's her side view. And I wanted you to see this. Because what we, the reason she's got a skewer in her head is so that you make sure that the ears come out evenly. Because when you're doing one side at a time, it's hard to be sure they're right where they belong. Okay, keep going. Okay, this was just another one that I did that I would have liked to have cast possibly and did not. All right, st stop there for a second. Um, sure. Then once you have a piece that you like, you divide it into half. You use metal pieces that we often use. We cut up soda cans, believe it or not, and make these pieces to in a head to put around the head. Now you can show the other two. And what we do is we throw, literally throw the plaster onto the uh, piece, next one. And so this is, it's got a blue tint in the plaster. Uh, this is a face you're gonna see, obviously you can't really see it. You do one step this way, you can show the back just to give people an idea. Okay, so that was the back and you'll see this finished piece. Okay, that's it, thank you, Mark. Sure. Um, and then you continue to finish the mold until it's about this thick and the outer layers are white. 
The reason being, when you go back to take it out of the mold, when you get to the blue, you know you're getting close. So once you are have your mold, you let it dry, you now open it out, which you can do using the silver divider things. And once it is out, you clean out the inside of the mold. You now have what is known as a waste mold. You clean it out, you let it dry, and then you paint it with soap. You put it back together, seal the edges, turn it upside down, and pour hydrocal. Hydrocal is a harder form of plaster of Paris. You pour it in and um, you wait for it to dry. Once it's dry, you are now at the stage where you're chipping it out. It just looks like a big wad. And you start chipping it out with a chisel. That's where you feel like Michelangelo, except he did it without <laughs> putting a mold inside. He could just see the sculpture in marble. Um, so when it's finished, it looks a little bit like this. Now this does have a coating, but it's like white. Just like if you've ever made plaster of Paris things in, um, day ca in camp, you know, it's the same kind of material. So let me just show you the back. This was the first piece I ever casted. And um, then you put shellac on it. Here's a piece that just has shellac. So you see, just like what you would think, it was white and now there is shellac on it. And that it, once you're finished chipping it out, and you've got this piece of hydrocal, you might have to patch it. You might've lost a piece of the nose or some fingers. Those are the things that often break off and then you patch it. And um, from there you can shellac it and then put a patine on, which is really just paint, a certain kind of paint. So I'm now gonna show you some of my sculptures. Forgive the seasickness for a minute. <laughs> I just wanted to show you, so this is, one of the first pieces I did at PAFA, and um, this piece was actually fired. What does that mean? If you use a good, clean clay, you can, and you hollow out the bottom, you hollow out the inside a little bit, you can then fire it, which is a whole lot easier than casting, but it's sort of cheating in a way, although it isn't really. So this was the first piece I did at PAFA after a vacation of like 20 years. Um, we all, I also did two figure sculpture. Actually, believe it or not, the two figures are sometimes easier than the one figure. The reason being is that you can draw on the platform on the, on the bottom like where the half is, you know, and where the knees are. So you have something to measure it against. When you're doing it in space, you can't really measure it. So I'll just show you um, a quick view of the two figure. And now I'm going to move to This is um, a head I did of a man. People often think it's a woman because of the hair, but it was a man. And uh, you can choose any color. You'll see this is similar to the color. It's a little more bronzy looking than the other one I showed you. And you can make it any color you want. You saw the two figure one was kind of reddish. So just to, um, I hope that you're able to see this fairly well. And um, and then we have should have been behind me. Okay, this is another piece that won some awards, and um, I'm just going to show this a little slowly so you can see it. So, you know, as you're working in the classroom, you're, you're constantly looking at it because if you stay, like if you stay too long on the side and then all of a sudden you turn your armature around and it's like, oh my goodness, I kind of got this all wrong because 
I was only looking at one side. Okay. And this is a sculpture that you saw being cast. This is the first time I got involved in using a little bit of color. If you can see her eyes are blue. This model had amazing blue eyes and I kept trying to figure out a way to get that into it. I got into more of this kind of silvery finish. Um, and there is her. And then my last one I'm gonna show you, I, I have a whole bunch more, but I think you get the idea. I had always said I was going to try other classes of Fleischer, but uh, never can quite bring myself to not do sculpture. So I like to put the Mardi Gras beads on her because she is sort of a character. I don't know how well you can see this one because she's so big. Oh, that's good. I'd like to show you what she really looks like. She sits in my bedroom with her Mardi Gras beads. Um, these were all done from live models. And I just think like she, she needs something. So that's about it. And unless there's any questions, thank you so much. It was a pleasure sharing my work with you. Matt, take it away. Oh, thank you, Linda. And um, you guys are pros because everybody is running exactly at 15 minutes. So thank you for making the job easy <laughs> um, at this end. And um, it's such a pleasure and a privilege to live with art. And I imagine that it's a kind of uh, a very specific pleasure to live with your own work and be able to kind of revisit it over the years. Um, maybe you yourself see it differently. Um, over time and take different things away from it. So that's really fascinating. Um, so next up is Joe Brin, um, who I've had the pleasure of knowing, I believe, since the beginning of joining RS for me in 1997. Um, and Joe is an architect, an artist, a documentary filmmaker, and a writer based in Philadelphia. Um, he writes and photographs on Philadelphia architecture, preservation, and culture um, for the Hidden City Daily Blog. Um, Joe's first film, Shivte, Lost and Found, um, is about an historic row house synagogue congregation in South Philadelphia on 4th Street, um, which was featured in the Summer Shorts Jewish Film Festival of 2019. Um, I've watched Shivte um, and found it very um, uh, kind of poignant, um, and th there's a certain drama to it. And if you happen to be from a family um, that arrived in Philadelphia, you know, probably from Eastern Europe around the turn of the century, it's likely that your family had some kind of connection to a small row house uh, synagogue like Chief Tay. So definitely recommend it. Um, Joe's new film in production is called A String of Pearls, The Small Miracles of Charles Middleburg. And it's uh, one survivor's story of hope, defiance, and optimism in the face of the Holocaust. Um, so uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce Joe. You're muted, Joe. Sorry about that, people. Um... Matt, did you mention that you were associated with the Philadelphia Museum of Art? Uh, no, <laughs> because because this is about you guys. Um, well, no. But, but yeah, I, I uh, worked at the Philadelphia Museum of Art for 23 years, um, working primarily as a writer. So it was a wonderful, 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 life-changing experience. Okay. I just didn't want you to be too modest. Oh, uh, Joe. <laughs> So, uh, well, I was trying to follow up on Bettina's description of her family as liars, uh, thieves, and misfits, and I, I couldn't quite come up with something that matched that, but it was an intriguing um, mention and reminded me that as a filmmaker, I'm very interested in stories and personal life stories, I guess I would call them. 
Um, my approach to filmmaking, you know, given my background is in architecture and, and even sculpture and art uh, and writing is multidisciplinary and uh, collaborative. And that's how I approach it. And, and I'm kind of inspired by uh, John Houston, the director talked about film as being representing the ac acrobatic nature of human thought. And I thought that's how I work and think. I mean, you jump and weave and dive and switch from one thing to another and it, it comes together obviously because acrobats have to stick the landing um, but it's it's a real adventure and a thrill to, uh, as a medium to work in. So I don't want to take up any too much time, but I did want to mention we just established a nonprofit called Cyclorama Films, and that is essentially the vehicle for producing the uh, film on Charles Middleburg, whom I met at Rode F. Shalom a couple of years ago when he gave a talk to the Merkaz Lamoud uh, students. And um, so filmmaking doesn't exist without funding. It's just uh, uh, more, more so than almost any medium. It, it simply will not happen. It'll be the tree falling in the forest. So uh, I just wanted to mention we have in our midst, I think, Roberto Pace, who is the composer for the film. And in the Q&A sec section, if you have a question, uh, you could run that by him. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to just show the film and then segue to the Q&A after that. Audio. My name is Charles Middleburg. I am a Holocaust survivor. To the best of my recollection, we had a very happy home.
when Paris was liberated, my little brother and I, we were beside ourselves with joy because the nightmare is over. We, mom and dad are coming back. And we're going to be again the, the happy family that we were before. But as time went by, it wasn't to be so. The last time that we kissed my mom, and we went with this lady that took us out to the farm, is the last time you ever saw my mom again. She never came back. It's not easy to keep talking about it, but I think it's something that I must do as long as I am alive and as long as I can talk coherently and have people listen to me and understand why am I doing this. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, let me see, we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule, um, so we can move quickly um, into the Q&A. Yeah. Um, before moving on, I just kind of want to comment on my own. Um, having seen, having known Joe a bit over these years, having seen Shivte and having seen this film, there's such a wonderful human and humane and humanistic quality um, to the work. and. You know, I, I think that Joe did a remarkable job with this, you know, kind of instructive clip adaptation of, of showing how he works and, you know, kind of creating a, a, a piece of art that begins with a kind of childlike, nostalgic, sweet feel and, and brings in, um, you know, this great sense of, of tragedy kind of while maintaining a certain um, tone and certainly a, a, a continuation in, in the visual tone. So all kudos to Joe. Um, so there are some great questions that have come in um, from uh, various members of the audience. And um, what I would like to do if we could make it work, um, Mark, is to kind of yeah. call on people uh -huh. um, to, to ask their questions themselves and since the questions came in by presenter, we might as well, you know, kind of continue that mode. Yes. Um, so, yeah. um, so Gail, um, actually, if, if we, Gail Meister, um, if we could begin with your question for uh, Bettina. Bettina. You know, unmute yourself. <laughs> I did. Okay, yeah, you're good. Yeah. Okay, I'm good. Uh, thank you all, that was, that was really inspiring. I am so knocked out by the, the beauty and talent of all of you. Question for Bettina is particularly, so what governs your decision to use photos versus animation or some combination of those? And I also would like to hear about 
what how your path to be an artist was supported or not supported by your family yeah um I, gail can you clarify the question in terms of like are you talking in, in the alf in the alf movie like how i used photographs and and then also like not so good animation <laughs> well i don't know if that it was not so good but you used animation in photos yes yeah yeah so i mean in in terms of the photos i um I just, that's all I have. I have like a small suitcase of photographs that I carry around with me from one place to another. Um, Cause I've moved a lot, you know? And I don't, I don't, I don't have a family home. I don't have like an attic at my parents, or my grandparents' house that doesn't exist for me, you know? Um, and so I have these few photographs of being a kid in, in Paraguay and then coming to Miami. And um, and so I, I spent a lot of time with the, those photos as objects. Um, and that you know that's they're 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 important to me you know um so that's that's why i use them and i don't i don't have regular access to my homeland because it's expensive to go there and all of these different things so i i don't get to go as often as i want to that footage in the in the beginning in the montage is footage that i did shoot in paraguay last time i was there was 2017 my mom lives there um and so does the rest of my family. And yeah, and then in terms of animation, I I have like, I do not know what I'm doing at all. Um, I, I don't, I just don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I I had this like lofty idea that that piece, the ALF piece was actually commissioned um, by this um, indigenous art group in Canada. And I, I, you know, I pitched it to them. And then when it came to, to deliver, I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. So I literally just cut out Alf, like I printed a bit, oh my, it's right here. I printed Alf out <laughs> twice. And in one, I like moved his snout around. And so it's actually like frame by frame. I don't know, whatever, I'm gonna learn. I'm gonna learn how to be an actual <laughs> animator at some point. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of my family, uh, they've always been very, yeah, they've always been very supportive, but it's, it's, they've always just been like, do whatever you want. I don't know if that's supportive or if that's just like understanding that I'm going to do whatever I want anyway. Like, I guess they just always understood that. And they think, I, you know, like, they think I'm funny and they think I'm strange and they and they like it, you know. Um, my mom is also an artist. She's a painter and she she did um, ceramics when I was a, a child. Um, so mostly they just laugh and they enjoy it. But we don't really have big conversations about art or anything like that. That it's it, you know. I mean, my parents are intellectuals in some ways, but not. Um, I don't know. I think that they think I'm kind of strange and they love me for it, and that's okay. Um, that's kind of the vibe. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Well, that sounds like a lovely family as it should be. <laughs> <laughs> so kudos to everybody on that. Um, so uh, Michael Candelori, you have a great question for Linda. Um, so if you could please share it. Hi, hello everybody. Uh, I am the voice of ALF from that project, <laughs> but I will spare you all bad voice today. <laughs> um, Linda, my question is basically, you know, because of COVID and even just more broadly, how everything is kind of moving to digital consumption. A lot of art can be experienced on a screen. It, it's a compromise, but, you know, I can look at a painting on a large screen and get much of the same experience of seeing it in person. Sculpture is not that way, because in, in addition to needing to three, see it 360, sometimes it's even tactile. You know, I mean, I've you climb on sculptures in public parks and things. And so um, how do you think sculpture will weather like this change in how we experience art? Um, you know, I'm thinking things like virtual reality, being able to, you know, move around virtually around sculpture and, you know, where just your thoughts on the future of this art, which I think is probably lost among younger people today. Okay, thank you for the question. I, I'd like to start by saying I hope and think it's temporary. <laughs> you know, we won't always be in pandemic mode. Um, but 
certainly you've all seen, or most of you have probably seen those real estate virtual reality where you can walk into a room and then you can kind of spin around. Well, you certainly could film it that way. I know that used to be proprietary software. If I had a professional uh, photographer to light it and work with and a proper turntable, then I'm sure you could experience sculpture that way in a, in a very, you know, kind of almost real way, like with good lighting and the proper equipment. And I, I don't think it'll always be this way. So I do, I am hopeful that we'll be able to see things in person again. And, and a quick follow up on that. Do you see that like sculptors can translate their skill in building figures to like digital animation, right? Like I imagine a sculptor would be very good at creating characters digitally because they understand the mechanics of bodies and how people move and work and, and you know, how, how to build a, a figure basically. It would probably be very helpful. I have not tried it. All of my work is done from a live model. So I'm not creating it from scratch. I'm trying to show what I see. And yes, there's some interpretation involved in that as because you can come to our art class and there'll be 15 people working and, and it's one model, but everybody's piece looks a little bit different. So there is definitely an interpretation in there. But the animation thing, you know, sounds interesting. Uh, the problem for me is that means more software learning. And frankly, I'd rather do this kind of work than work on more programs sure. at this point in my life. Well, your work is beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. But I just, um, you know, Michael raises such a good point. And, um, you know, he, 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 right, you raised it, Michael, specific to sculpture. Um, you know, but we're all trying to kind of figure out how to go about living and kind of adjust the ways we live and the things we do during this, the shutdown of pandemic. And, um, you know, with Linda's work being sculpture and being 360, there, there is obviously a clear challenge. But I was wondering, um, you know, for uh, Bettina and Joe, um, either one of you or both, um, have you found that, you know, this period has impacted the way you work or how you show your work? Um, well, I, I can just say that one thing I've discovered from this pandemic situation is that creative work is actually one of the best antidotes to sort of the mental anguish and limitations of the situation. So it's been very productive time for me and sort of made me realize how valuable it is for myself and also to share with others. Yeah. I always right. said that my sculpture class was the fastest three hours of the week. Hmm. You know, it's just totally devoted to what you're working on and you're not thinking about anything else. Yeah. And of course with film, everything is streamed these days. So, you, you know, quote, you don't even have to go to a theater. Although I think something is definitely lost and hopefully will be recovered in the sort of communal experience. Thanks, Joe. I mean, for, me, um, for me, COVID has been completely devastating in terms of um, the film industry. So the film industry completely shut down at the beginning of the pandemic. And then very slowly, um, you know, things were implemented in order to make it you know, feel safe. And I was able to work on a COVID set a, about a month ago. Um, and we were, you know, we were getting tested three times a week, everybody was quarantined in the same hotel because you have, you know, actors have to take their PPE off, right? Like we have, we can't wear this protective equipment when we're on screen. Um, so, I mean, in that regard, the industry was like demolished and transformed by the pandemic. Um, and we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens. I think this story has a, the story of the pandemic still has a pretty long arc you know, but for me as a person who loves, I'm a very social person. I hadn't actually realized that until the pandemic. I was always like, oh yeah, I'm, I, I like being at home and reading books and blah, blah. And then it, this happened and I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love hanging out with people and going places and experiencing art. I love going to the movies. 
I love going to a theater and then having something happen. Like everyone's in this dark room together and then <gasps> something happens and everybody reacts in different ways or people laugh. And then at the end you start talking and somebody overhears you talking and, and they think, oh, I disagree or no, I saw that too. And I, that's to me that that's so beautiful about um, the social aspect of art, right? Because I do spend a lot of time at home making things, right? And in my own head, but it's important that it live in the world and that you experience people experiencing other people's art. And I can't wait for this future world where we will get to do that again. Yeah. So thanks, Bettina. And actually, um, you actually opened a little bit of a window to talking about Jewishness. <laughs> with that because you know there's such a correspondence between going to a theater going to a museum and you know going to a synagogue or church or mosque for for worship and you can you know you can do that on screen online but obviously there's there are so many components to it um, you know to the in person live experience that you're not getting by doing it online so it's just interesting to think about the parallels um, you know between you know worlds that we think of as being so different, you know the the religious and the secular and and such. So just little observation. Um, so Gail is is back in the in the queue um, with a great question for Linda. Um, and if and with apologies or whatever um, whatnot to Gail and Linda, I kind of want to preface Gail's question with a little bit to Linda from me. Um, so you're working from alive models and you're. Your kind of task is to, um, you know, create a depiction of the live model. But looking at your work, there are clearly things that are animating, you know, what you're making. Like, there's definitely a sense of character. There's, you know, there might be, and I guess this is kind of my question for you is, you know, whether while you're working, you're thinking about who that person is, you know, what is the story of their day, what is the story of their life, um, and you know, whether, whether or not those thoughts are in your mind um, to those kinds of um, things that are personal to the, the model. Um, and, um, and kind of from that question, I'm gonna to toss this over to Gail. I, th I think the question was, th the work is clearly representational and yet you are obviously making decisions as you go along, as, as Matt was suggesting. So, it, it's like when it's going to be a rough bunch of a rough surface or whatever. I'm sure you can describe it more fully. So uh, I just wondered what your thoughts were about that when you're just making what you see exactly, exactly. And it has to look like the body or the, when you add the artistic flourishes. Well, what I alluded to before uh, talking about how if there's 15 people in the room and we're all looking at the same model and everybody's sculpture looks very different. Like there's a guy who, you know, most of us who take these classes at Fleischer have been doing it for a number of years. Many of the people I'm sculpting with have been doing it for 30, 35 years. And um, like there's this one guy who's like six foot two and all of his sculptures look very tall. Very, you know, very, very tall. And one of the hardest things for an artist to do is to not make it look like ourselves. We tend, <laughs> it, it sounds funny, but we tend to, you know, if you have a long face, then you're probably going to make a long face despite yourself. You know, you think you've gotten it the right shape. Um, I think a lot of it is subconscious. Um, and then a lot of it is, well, I know I always do this, so let me look at this again and again from a lot of different views and see if I can make it more accurate. And yet, when at the end of class, when we push back our sculptures and we stand back and we look at everybody's, you can pick out who's is who based on what they look like in person. And of course, we also get to know each other's styles somewhat, but it's just, you know, somebody's heavy, they tend to make everybody a little bit chunkier <laughs> than everybody else. Yeah. Um, and as for the, I just wanted to sort of answer the, the Jewish thing there. Um, I think that Jews in general have a, a, a greater emphasis on arts and culture and education. Um, I know that my parents completely supported me and, you know, 
I won't say pushed, but certainly encouraged me to be creative. And what was interesting is when I went for my interview at UArts, um, the first question they asked me was, what do your parents, this is when I was in high school, what do your parents think about you going into the arts? And it was because so many parents don't support that. So that's not exactly the Jewish thing, but it is about my Jewish parents that they right. always encouraged it. Yeah. And my, you know, my twin sister's also an artist, um, not by trade as much as I am, but she's a wonderful watercolorist. So everybody in our family found some way to be creative. Beautiful, beautiful. So Joe, um, I have a question for you that we've discussed a little bit before. So um, all three of the artists are, have, are very um, multifaceted, multi, <laughs> multifaceted <laughs> individuals, and they're also multifascinating. Um, and um, <laughs> Joe, so I was interested in, in you know, kind of hearing about how the different elements of your life, architecture, um, visual art, filmmaking, um, writing, um, you know, are, are kind of interwoven um, or not um, in, the, in the work that we saw from you. Um, and I'm also especially interested in how you arrived at, at Silhouettes um, as the medium for which you wanted to tell the story. And then to kind of like tag one, one more bit of question in here, I, I found the, the music to be, um, to do so much to set the tone, especially the music at the beginning, which kind of sounded like a music box, um, you know, with the kind of plinking, uh, plinking notes, which kind of has a nostalgic feel and a kind of childlike feel. So anyway, um, I guess uh, kind of just to talk, ask you why you did what <laughs> um, in, in the film that you're working on currently. Right. Well, um, there's, a, there's a lot in there. Uh, in terms of wanting to use silhouettes, that, that's an important question because uh, I can trace it back to a childhood memory of uh, neighbors who had had traditional silhouettes done as portraits of their children, as opposed to hiring a photographer, which, you know, is the usual way. And those images are burned into my memory and they're always fascinating. They, they look very lifelike, but you're looking at a profile. So you're not seeing them head on, their faces head on. So. I came to Silhouettes because I thought, well, this is a medium where it's all in shadow, it's in profile. You really can't see obvious facial expressions so that the medium actually forces the viewer to read in between the lines, so to speak. And it doesn't tell you what to think and feel. You have to bring that to it. So I, I was intrigued with that potential meaning there's not a happy face or a sad face to, to clue you into what you should be feeling. So that guided me for a long way, but it did evolve into more, ironically, more clarity uh, in terms of expression, but I still walk the line of not wanting to tell you what to think or feel. Um, in terms of my background, I mean, I'm a photographer so and, and a filmmaker, so I set up the camera on a tripod and fil filmed myself carving this paper. And I've, in my past, have carved stone in Italy. So it's, and structuring the story was almost like structuring a building. You know, you have a foundation and you have pieces that have to hold each other up. So the analogies are endless. And uh, working with Roberto, which who I think has, left the building, but Roberto is a perfect collaborator. He understands, he met Mr. Middleburg and uh, he has a great feeling for the story. And if you listen to that music box, he pointed this out, but I picked up on it as well. It's childlike, it's musical, it's, it has a delicacy to it, but there's a little bit of a, a, a minor note is struck along the way. And then it picks back up again to the more innocent childlike tone. And that's an amazing way of hinting that there's there's something threatening or sinister that may be in the mix here. Yeah. 
And in this particular clip that you all saw, I specifically left out any reference to German soldiers or even the war images. Um, but the music kind of is in there sending little messages. I don't know if that answers any of the many questions yeah. you had, but oh, no, uh, it's great that it's great that you um because yeah, as I'm kind of hearing it again in my mind's ear, um, I, I can hear the kind of foreshadowing in the music. Um, so that's fascinating. So we're at the two fifteen mark, which means that um, kind of the formal part of our program is over. We might be a little bit past. Um, so ha are there, does anybody have any questions or comments that haven't been? shared yet we will be going into 15 minutes of unstructured time um also um so if, if you're uh if you're able and have the time to kind of hang in for those additional 15 minutes please do um i want to yeah, I, I put some things in the chat i wanted to mention okay um could, are, jerry are you able to save it for the uh the post 215 um yeah that's what i'm talking that's what i'm talking okay. about Okay, sounds great. So uh, one big takeaway for today is that, um, you know, every person that you meet has so much going on that you have no idea what's going on. And Road of Shalom is such a large congregation. It's, you know, I think technically 3,000 different people. Um, and there are so many stories and, you know, there are great stories. And it's, this is a nice introduction to realizing that people you might see at services or otherwise are also, you know, creating wonderful art. Um, I want to thank Bettina, Linda, Joe, and Mark, and everybody who's attended today. Um, I hope everybody was happy with the event. I found it very fascinating. Um, I encourage you to fill out the evaluation forms, which Mark has shared into the chat. And again, um, we'll be continuing in unstructured time immediately after this. So if you're wanting to and able to hang in, please do. So um, again, I'm Matt Singer, uh, coming to you from Road of Shalom, Days of Learning, um, over and out for now. But I'll continue to be here also. <laughs> Great job, Matt. Great job. Thanks, guys. Um, if anyone's interested Thanks, in doing silhouettes, um, I there's an art supplies list that Mark has that he can send you. Now put your email in the chat and we'll send it to you. I just want to say it, it was fun working with Matt and Linda and Bettina uh, and Mark to make this happen. You don't, you don't realize behind the, the curtain that a lot of things have to come together and yeah, we don't show, we don't show the sweat, but it, it paid yeah. off. <laughs> you almost well, did it again. <laughs> there was an absolutely beautiful, fascinating program. I just uh, can't thank everybody enough. It just um, was lovely. And each of you had such a different uh, style and kind of art that made it even um, more mesmerizing. But I, I have a question for each of you. And that is, Linda said that when she's working, three hours can go by like nothing. And I'm wondering if, if does it feel like sacred time to you when you're creating uh, a film or a sculpture? Dina, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. So yeah, I mean, yeah it definitely feels, um, yeah, it's a form of prayer, I think, to create. You're engaging with something. I mean, there's something ancestral about it. I definitely feel like, there's, I'm connecting to ancestors for sure, right? Or, and I, I like, and I'm also connecting to this flow um, of, of this desire to create, right? That, that has always existed. And that is beyond human, right? That we share with our non-human relations as well. And just like the way that the universe is in this process of, of creation too. Um, but it's also just a lot of fun and it's it's extremely relaxing and i find it i find that it is a form of medicine that i don't understand but i know that i am experiencing healing um especially when i am working with my hands right there's something about that where i i know that medically there's something going on where, where i'm being healed it's not just spiritual in that way too 
I you. totally agree with that, Christina. Um, I think um, I just feel, for lack of a better word, a little bit of a high, like this is so great. I just enjoy doing it and uh, severely miss it. People have said, do it at home. There is no way, you have no idea how filthy it is. I, I wear rags to class. And um, anyway, but it, it's just very freeing. Um, you're just doing what you do and it just comes from deep inside and it feels good. You're, you're absolutely right, Bettina. Joe, do yeah. you wanna add? I, I would concur with uh, both of those thoughts. And I think one thing um, that happens when you get into the thick of it is that you really get out of your own way and there's a certain flow that happens that's kind of beyond yourself and you can almost step back and wonder well where did that come from you know and uh, so very good things happen and you would think that's a solitary benefit or a solitary activity but as Bettina said in a movie theater or even in a zoom chat all of a sudden you're taking this kind of private production and putting it out there and you can be really surprised at people's reactions and what they can tell you about what they see so it, that even makes it even more joyful i think yeah if i could jump off of that what you just said joe because that's what i, I wanted to try to relay something to you bettina when I saw your animation, um, yes, admittedly, it is crude, but I saw a point to that crudeness in the cultural shock your parents must have been going through and your strong connection between two different cultures. And you have to separate visually that for people to be able to see that. That's how I accepted it. Yeah, I think, I mean, <laughs> I, I think you maybe undersold yourself, but I think it was that the simplicity and, and even primitive quality of the animation that I actually prefer as opposed to something that was very slick. I think, um, you know, you're putting something together and you can see it on the screen and a piece of this and a piece of that. And it was very charming, I thought. I agree. And it tot I totally got the feeling the, the chaos and stuff that you must have been feeling as a kid going into this completely different culture. And I thought that the film really brought that out. You could feel it. There was great emotion in it. Well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. It means a lot. Actually, Bettina, if I, if I may, kind of trying to like be a person rather than a moderator. <laughs> um, so I, I was so kind of intrigued with and delighted with um, your your employment of ALF um, and thought about ALF as an alien and whether or not, you know, that kind of resonated with any feeling of alien, um, of, of being alien or, or being in a, in a culture that was alien to you. Um, and then um, I noticed that ALF, um, in addition to speaking uh, Guarina, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, also spoke a little Yiddish. Um, <laughs> so I, so I was wondering if if um, if if Alf um, was multicultural in those ways too. Yeah. So Alf is Jewish. That's Yay! The point. Well, <laughs> good point. Yeah. He's. Um, I'm, I. So, the, you know, like I said, I was raised in the occult and, you know, my mom is a pretty serious occultist. So I was, I was raised with like alien, like a alien stuff, you know? And then when I got to the States and I was eight years old, um, you know, like through this, there was this sort of pro long process, but eventually like we got our alien registration card and I had no, um, like I didn't, I, I, didn't all of the interaction that I had with the concept of alien was these beings from outer space that were a part of this like you know spirituality or whatever that my mom raised us in you know and then I was an alien and I was like okay <laughs> um and so I've yeah I've just been like hanging out with aliens forever right 
Um, and then it turns out that I'm that I I I had like an official piece of paper that said that I was one too, and Alf was always my favorite. Um, and I mean, I did have this Alf doll, the one that could talk. I wish I still had it because it's totally amazing. Um, but I I wanted so I specifically made Alf Jewish because I mean this is an ongoing project, right? This is episode one because I wanted to find a way to weave it, to weave that in, right? To have conversations about Judaism and, you know, indigenous American cultures and so that, that ALF is the way to do that. I did want to say something to Matt because I knew um, the premise of this uh, session was how Jewish values factor into the artist's work. And I, I would say amongst the three of us, none of us had a simple, easy, obvious answer, or even reason to think about it. And uh, I would say uh, it's possibly because we take it for granted, it's just part of us. We don't really have to explain it to anyone. But I think Matt touched on something that, at least for me, makes sense. And that is the humanistic tradition or the humanistic values. And that I would ascribe to, I would say, yes, that, that's, a, for me, a connection. Um, and the, the fact that we have to think about the ethics and the impact on individuals and the community. But if I were to explore your question further, it would be in that direction. Right, right. I mean, because it is, it is baked into the tradition, especially the liberal <laughs> tradition. But, um, you know, so much of Judaism is about what you do in the here and now instead of the life to come. There isn't really any assurance or clear ideas about that, um, and it's and ethics and how you treat other people and and you know treat the world and you know the the laws of kosh, kosh kosherness um, are so involved and we can get kind of lost in them. But you know ultimately you know things like that and things about how you observe Shabbat are are about being mindful, um, which is such a buzzword now. It's kind of it's kind of mindfulness before mindfulness. Um, and it, it's kind of gotten, you know, entwined with a lot of law and a lot of confusion. But I, I always feel, you know, my own personal take is that this is about mindfulness. Um, and uh, so it, it's a part of the Jewish culture that is very central to my own experience, too. Can I ask Patina a question? Sure. Um, in the animated film, you there's two images of birds at the beginning. There's a beautiful hummingbird with a passion flower. And then as you're becoming an immigrant, there's a bird in a cage. Is that something that you felt when you came to the United States that um, you were caged? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, 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 in Paraguay, I grew up outdoors. So it's very wild. And I grew up surrounded by animals and like climbing trees and just like being in nature. And then we, we came to the States and we were in an apartment building in Miami Beach. And it was just like, I don't know what this is, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, but the thing that really definitely saved me was that um, just that, that, that Jewish community predominantly of just really like grandparents who were hanging out there, you know. Um, and it felt, um, yeah, it, I mean, it honestly, it felt very tribal. Like it felt, it had that feeling that I had from back home, right? Of like, this is, there's this, um, there's this information that's buzzing in the air that everybody knows about. And it just informs how you are and how you treat each other, right? Like there's this, there's this way of being in the world. It's a particular kind of knowledge, right? And yeah. it, um, that resonates, right? I think it resonates within all kinds of like indigenous tribal cultures where you're sharing this um, way of being. But yeah, I mean, uh, being like, like being an immigrant to, to the, like a person of color immigrating to the US, you go through this process of racialization that's extremely violent, right? Like, so I went from being a person to being a person of color. I went from having like a culture that I came from to having a culture that was othered, right? Um, and so I, I had to think about a lot of stuff in that way. Um, and I still, I mean, I still do. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah. That's great. I, I I have a, to, oh, go ahead, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I, was, I, I had a question for Joe. Yes. Uh, 
yeah, why, why did you show the making of the uh, silhouettes as part of your film? Well, actually, what I showed you is, is not the film that I'm producing, which is the, the story of Charles Middleburg, but um, I, I didn't, that film is not completed yet. So I personally, you know, thought it would be interesting for people to see how I take a story and transform it into imagery. And so it's not computer animation. It's, it's, it's not a typical approach. The silhouettes are old fashioned. It's like a traditional medium. And uh, I took a lot of pleasure in sort of trying to bring that current and, uh, you know, wanted to people to see the how, the how to of it. And uh, that's all. Really? Yeah, no, no, that, that explains it. And it was very interesting to see it. Thanks, thanks. And, uh, you know, I have to say that a film like that could be very, uh, uh, what I showed you, could be very much like watching grass grow, right? So it, as a film, it was a real challenge to keep the viewer engaged and move the story along while still showing that this takes effort, Like right? You can see it in my hands. They tense up when it's making a hard cut or turning a corner. Uh, I just wanted the people to get a feeling for what it takes because we're so awash in imagery these days, you know, on TV, on our phones, you know. So this is a chance to see the crafting of an image, I guess. Yeah, it's a great balance between, you know, film being kind of like an industrial age, a purely industrial age, uh, medium, it, you know, it, it couldn't have been made before the inventions of, of certain technologies. Right. And then mm -hmm. so much film is done, you know, not even using film, you know, but digitally now, you know, so you, you married that with, you know, a very, very clearly hands-on painstaking physical process. Mm. Do we have time for my question? Sure. I mean, we're technically over, but I don't know if we're just going to shut don't hang up some on point. Me. Don't hang up on me. Yeah, there's uh, always time for Jerry. Oh, uh, uh, you're you're very sweet. Thanks. <laughs> all right, real real quick, I'll I'll say all three things, and then each of you can respond if you want. Uh, first is a question for Joe. If you know Joe, uh, if you know Joe Borcho, same style stuff. And the question for Linda is, do you do? And all three of you did great. So this is a fabulous presentation. People are lurking in our midst, as somebody said before, and we don't even know what what's behind what's behind their face, you know, it's really fabulous. Uh, so so that's a Joe Board Show for Joe. Linda, I'm curious to know if you do paper mache, since you could probably do that at home without getting too messed up. And <laughs> for Tina, uh, I, I had put in the chat that when I visited Bolivia, I, I didn't know that they had changed the name of the country to the plurinational state of Bolivia to reflect different nationalities, which I thought was fascinating. That's kind of like what's What's in Paraguay? I was wondering if they ever thought of changing their name similarly. But I'll close with a comment regarding what Bettina said about the movies. That I went to a Jewish film festival, and there was a film that ended with the. It was it was very obscure what actually happened at the end. It was about an Orthodox woman getting a divorce, and when I went to the men's room, this guy the next urinal said, "Wow, that was that was really something." I said, yeah, I said, you know, I never expected the, the woman, you know, would walk out like that. He said, you think that's what happened? I thought it was the guy that walked out. <laughs> so, you know, you never know when a conversation is going to come up in the bathroom. That wouldn't happen at home. <laughs> well, leave your door open and you never know. <laughs> so, Joe, so yeah, just well, a big answer what Jerry said, because believe it or not, I have to leave shortly for a job. <laughs> that I work at at three o'clock, but um, paper mache for me wouldn't really work. I haven't done it in probably since I was a little kid, um, but clay and working with clay is, is a different feel to it. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't get that with paper mache. It's, you know, about making, you know, a muscle or something like it, paper mache, you're putting layers, I don't know. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a different experience. I understand. Yeah, and Joe, do you know Joe? Uh, well, 
Jerry is mentioning Job. I don't know, how do you pronounce his name? His last name. Lord Job. Yeah. Well, I, I actually, when I started this project, I got in touch with him because I said, I need someone who can cut silhouettes, and uh, he. So we had a couple of emails, but he was busy at the time and just had a child. So, uh, but I had seen those around, and I and I eventually said, well. I guess I'll do it myself. So <laughs> I kind of had to teach myself and, you know, became Wasn't more facile. Wasn't there anything on YouTube? What's that? Wasn't there anything on YouTube? You can learn anything there. <laughs> you can learn anything, but I, I wanted to come at it from my own, my own point of view, I guess, my own method. Well, and I think he would really appreciate seeing your work because it's so, it's so, so, fabulous and so so similar i i give him another chance because i think he'd love to share with you oh yeah no I'll, i probably will get in touch great thanks everybody for coming thank you matt for moderating us and i'm sorry but i've got to go so you thank, you. Email thank you me. thank you thank you thank you thank you Everybody. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Linda. Yeah. So, so everybody, thanks for coming. I think we're going to lose the room anyway. Right. We're getting kicked out. <laughs> thanks, Matt, so much for moderating this program. Oh, and sure. thanks, Mark, for being the tech angel. I know it was really complicated. And um, you just you just made a, a fabulous program for us. We're very grateful. Wow. Thanks, that's, that's great. Matt. Great people to work with. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Actually, I, I meant to thank you and, and Gail um, and forgot. So that was a big apologies on that front. Oh um, yeah. But yeah, it was a it was a it was a good team effort. Yeah. It 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 was just such an evocative, fascinating program. I really can't thank you. Well, yeah, that's I'm I'm really glad to hear it. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> thank you for Mark, sure. Mark too. Bye. 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 Stay well. Stay healthy. Bye. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye -bye. You too. You too.